There's a concept known to humanity that is really more experimental concerning thinking than really probably a reality. I say probably because there's really no way for us to actually know. The idea is, could something have existed on this planet prior to us and then left? If you take all of human history, our buildings, our structures, what we've made on the rocks, on mountains, our connections with animals, our expansive networks of roads and cities, really any of it, it becomes rapidly apparent just how hilariously short-lived it all is. In the grand scheme of things, you're talking about 100,000 years or so, almost to completely erase all record that we even existed, apart from the small layer of plastic that will be found in the soils. Actually, there's a joke that if in the future another species arises after our extinction and decides to take up geology, they will find this layer and refer to it as the Homocene era because of what we've done. Whoa, ah, that nuclear waste uh, that we have to bury, but that's something totally different. Anyhow, plastic being our legacy aside, with this in mind, the next concept is how would we really know if there was something here before us? Even in the time it took for humans to become what we are according to the theory of evolution, which now puts us at around being modern humans around 300,000 years ago, as opposed to the previously agreed upon time frame of around 100,000 years, an entire civilization could evaporate and go missing during that amount of time that it took us to reach where we are now, and we would potentially have no idea it was even a thing. And could this be a reality? Well, the answer is yes, anything is possible, but is it probable? Not really. However, it does relate nicely into our video today, which it should, considering I'm the guy writing this. I'd have to be an absolute mad lad to just cut mid -sense. In the events of the devil below, a group of nerds, also known as geologists, I know, right? Geologists? Not even a good science, but I suppose necessary. And now that all the geologists have <laughs> clicked off of this video, uh, they're attempting to find a town in Appalachia that went completely silent. Following a river upstream, they would eventually run across potentially members of the former town, who aren't too happy that they're there, mainly because these random people just showed up in the middle of an ongoing war. Ignoring the advice of the locals to get out of there, they delve deeper into the forest before finding a sinkhole that they were after just to learn what was below the ground. That said, what is down there isn't necessarily great for your life expectancy. Appearing to be the cause of the town's disappearance, we have to ask, what are these creatures and where exactly do they come from? Well, let's discuss that in today's episode. So we kick off our story today with someone beating a bassoon to death every once in a while. You can't hear it, but it rustles my jimmies because there's no pattern to it. As blasting commences, it's obvious this is a mining operation where nothing bad happens and everyone enjoys their long-lived existence. Also, shout out actually unironically to the people who like mine stuff, because uh, if I say the other word, YouTube will nuke monetization and the ability to comment from orbit. It's a thankless job, but ridiculously necessary to really the most basic functioning society that we would be totally boned without the blue collar workers to pull that off. You guys are ballers and I love you. As the workers then leave for the day at Snoogum Hills, and I'm sorry, I know it shook them hills, but I cannot help myself. It's Snoogums. I don't make the rules. I just work here. The owner of the mine and his son are walking out of the very populated mine. Like there appears to be no less than three to four dozen people here while talking about firing another guy because he doesn't perform too well. The son being more sympathetic to the young man's plight says that he will talk to him, letting him know if he doesn't get his butt in gear, he's going to be working another mine. The dad then tells him to kind of just go grab his tools from the mine. And why did you leave those in there in the first place? I mean, if you're leaving for the day, shouldn't you, you already have those? But as he does, something unseen grabs him. He yells out for his old man as his dad spots him barely hanging on to the side of the connex, and the dad must be resisting the urge to yell, SHOOT HER! And he ultimately gets smacked in the face before getting stabbed by something, but he can't move to save his son as he gets pulled into the mine, presumably meeting a grisly fate. We now meet a woman who is researching the lost town. The town allegedly caught fire and everyone there met their end. Supposedly. Mapping out the location, the plan is to follow the river upstream and get a generalized idea of the area. Darren calls her and says, it's time to go. And he's British. That has nothing to do with anything. I just find it funny how it's just the Appalachian Mountains that we were talking about here. I mean, even in that remote area, you're more likely to find a town or hiker as well because it's pretty populated. This isn't even a bit. Are these mountains scary to the average British person? I mean, they're not even remote. Like, Yes, you can go missing up there, it does happen, except you're likely just being eaten by a regular person. Don't be a scrub, you'll be fine. And of course, stay strapped or get clapped. As they drive along remote roads, Terry starts getting upset because he doesn't want to let the woman drive and starts complaining about how there's no signal. Bold strategy, Cotton, complaining about your guy driving you to the location. Like, are you dumb? Darren then tells him to maintain professionalism and there will be no professionalism displayed for the duration of this event. He asks her, oh, how do you even know where you're going? It's almost like she's researched the place or something, dude. So they stop off at a hardware store near my house as Ariane enters. 
Yep, it's got all the classic green beans, some bones, a head in a jar in the back. Is that a hammer over there? It's poorly lit as well. So she asks to buy some coolant or water and then continues to ask directions. So I'm just gonna go ahead and like have to assume here that this was just a way to make conversation and get information out of this guy as a truck appears to be doing just totally fine. Also, I tried to find what vehicle this is. I'm like 40% sure it's an old Land Rover Defender, which is the last form of Land Rover that was actually good. No God, here comes the hate mail. So she continues to ask where this mystery town is, as a man says, Well, I've never heard of that town, Rotat. Wait, wrong team. Well, I've never heard of that town, Go Mountaineers, or something like that. I wasn't listening. So he proceeds to mention he's never heard of it, as I just said. And she mentions, uh, well, I'm pretty sure it does exist. And he's like, okay, sure. Uh, go back to the city where you came from. That's how you get there. Like, it's not helpful at all. But he calls out as she heads outside and says, we must be close because he told me to leave. Driving along, a station wagon begins tailing them. She pushes like 70 on the Defender and they start asking, oh, can you lose them? Uh, the station wagon eventually stops like literally just pulls off and they're all like super jazzed like, oh, you lost them. Nice driving. You didn't lose them. They just sort of stopped. This part made me laugh, like, had you actually got them off your tail, then absolutely. But seeing as they just kind of came to a gentle, gradual stop, eh. Arian then pulls off on another road as a station wagon passes, which makes you wonder why did he stop to begin with. Also, I should make it apparent that I know this isn't likely a station wagon. The name of this vehicle actually escapes me. I see it all the time when I go and I visit friends out in Austin, Texas. It's just one on the side of the road out there. But God, the name, I cannot remember what it is. But it's also because I'm more of a muscle car sort of guy. And also, if I sound tired, I just got done dropping in an engine and transmission into a 69 Mustang, and I am tired. So she informs the group of where they were run off, basically, and where that station wagon stopped. That's the route they need to take. Heading back to that point, they find a side road and pass a danger sign. Coming to a fence, they find it's electric. Woogie, woogie, woogie. Arian then finds a tree to climb and then gets over the fence. God, that was a lame joke. Uh, walking along, they move through the same cave system several times, as we will see, and through well-established trails, actually. Setting up camp, they talk about what they're looking for, a sinkhole where coal caught fire underneath the ground. It may have been man-made, it may have been natural, it may have been caused by monsters under the ground. We just aren't sure, but it probably wasn't that last one. But they are there to learn why this is the case, and they know that there was a mine here, there was a town here, and there were also people who worked the mines here. Where do they all go? And to this, Sean says, if there were people working the mines. He seems to think that the United States was trying to build an answer to the Soviet Union's cola borehole. Basically, back in the day, the Soviet Union wanted to know how deep they could drill. They drilled to a depth of 4,230 feet or 1,341 bald eagles, which coincidentally is how long it would take us to reach Proxima Centauri using a ship from the event horizon. That's basically one bald eagle per year. But that has nothing to do with anything. I just thought it'd be interesting. Also, I did a video over that if you're interested, but that's also about 12,262 meters in depth, according to heathen units. They abandoned the project after some time because the heat became too intense for the drills and it kept damaging them and basically shutting them down and melting them. It was around this time, also, the U.S. was in direct competition with the USSR, so it's alleged maybe the U.S. was trying to dig their own borehole for some reason. And another fun fact for you is there was an American town in Appalachia around this time that couldn't get the U.S. government to install a bridge that would span the river near their town that would cut an hour and a half or something like that off their drive time. So they contacted the USSR, which agreed to help fund building a bridge for a town in the U.S. just to embarrass the U.S. government. Hey now, the US government doesn't need any help embarrassing itself. It does that all the time. Officially labeled the government, they finally agreed to build this bridge just to not be shown up by the USSR. Like how childish is that? Proof that some people don't get more mature, they just get bigger. And if you're ever worried about World War III, just remember uh, this happened. And the same people who it likely happened to are still in power because Congress is a complete retirement home right now. Just don't think too much about it, and let the existential crisis wash over you as we move on. It's hypothesized this was a borehole the U.S. built, but they hit something just like the USSR did. Legend says a microphone was lowered into the borehole where they heard moans and screams. And this is a real legend, but also it's real fake. The USSR never did that supposedly, but then again, uh, I wasn't there. Number one thing to learn from all of this is don't put stuff in your borehole. So borehole created, town goes missing, everyone has a big cry about it. 
Sean says that they need to have an open mind with this and kind of take into consideration that the idea of myth and reality are a combination event with humans. Much like, you know, Jesus and mythological things or God potentially creating the universe and the singularity event. But as he's talking about this, we get the most atheist Reddit mod moment ever. Let me clarify real quick. Believe whatever you want. You're an adult. I don't care. But like 98% of you are according to my channel analytics. But if you say this statement, you are being judged as a huge nerd. In a voice I can only partially replicate because it's beyond me to not add the nasally effect, this dork answers Sean by saying, It was a rapid expansion of the primordial singularity 15 billion years ago. We get it, Darren. You're Jimmy Neutron levels of smart. Tell me about the sodium chloride table salt next. Boo this man! So Mr. Brain Blast over here continues to argue with Sean over it and is angry about the fact that they are looking for this thing, which, I mean, why are you angry? You agreed to come on this expedition. Presumably, you are also going to get paid. So stop being such a whiner about it and do your job, Mr. Geologist. Meanwhile, the town folk have found one of the electric traps has been pulled apart by something, and walking out into the woods to check the perimeter, a man finds the electric box, having just fried something down below, and does the non-Jimmy Neutron thing. And just a quick heads up, uh, if you can't see into the mystery hole and you know there's a monster in there, don't put your ear next to it, but this guy does for some reason, and he's immediately stabbed in the head, piercing his temple, severing his optic nerve behind his eye based on the eye damage that we see, and quickly succumbing to a brain bleed. What an idiot. He deserved that. Back to the science expedition, Darren starts trying to make a move on Ariane like a newborn giraffe. Pretty sure that woman would eat you alive, my man. Back over at Snoogum's Connex, the old man from earlier gets out to find one of their traps has been tripped. He asks if the younglings are still around, which is odd as they all seem relatively the same age. I see crow's feet on all their faces, just like me. Time is a nightmare. Ariane then keeps asking what Darren expects to find here, and he says if they can figure out what causes these fires, they can stop it from happening in the future. His alarm goes off, telling him it's time to take his vitamins. This man has just untold levels of riz. Yes, I do hear that's what the youths are saying nowadays. He nopes off, leaving her to her lean-to tent as they continue to their hike the next morning. Going back through the same cave as yesterday, maybe she doesn't know where she's going, but it's supposed to be a different cave, so she's fine. They all find a siren on the ground, and as they walk through, they find a house next to it with smoke coming out of the ground. Arian then spots a car as they duck to avoid detection and decide instead to keep moving rather than examine what that is. Following it to the mining area, smoke is exiting out of the ground everywhere, as then they spot it over a ridge, the mining town. Approaching Pioneer Village set in 1864, they just straight up break into a shop. Very good. They check the air levels and find there are elevated levels of CO2, but nothing crazy. They find everything was abandoned outright. Arian then opens a door and sees the rest of the mining town. Heading down, they find what they were looking for, a much larger sinkhole straight down. Darren and Sean are super psyched about it, as once again, it's electrified. They break the trap and open it up, and now you have to ask yourself, Covering up an emergence hole is one thing, but why would the locals electrify it, and why do you think you should be breaking those traps? Like, even a small amount of deductive reasoning at this point would tell you, hmm, I wonder if there's something down there. So they go to drop a tool that analyzes everything looking for anthracite. Oh yeah, uh, when Darren and Ariane are talking earlier, he said that he needed to find this pure form of energy. So as they drop it down there, they don't see anything, and then it hits the bottom pretty quickly, indicating this is not a borehole. They then find, as it's said in the movie, C15H11-0, which is supposed to be O, like oxygen, not dash zero. <laughs> Anywho, so this guy over here, uh, they are pretty stoked about the composition as it's very pure. As Terry continues to listen, he gets his eardrums blown by a scream. Getting scared, they listen to it as Terry then steps on the rope like a huge nerd, and because of this transgression, he's pulled into the hole. Falling down, they spot him actually still alive down there, which is absolutely wild as, I mean, that was pretty deep, but he's not unharmed. Hindered with a broken leg, he's then dragged off. Arian is going to go in after him along with Jamie, but after just watching this man get dragged off by something, uh, no. But they are strapped, so it's not all bad. Descending into the cave system together, it's pretty apparent that something else is down there with them. Meanwhile, the shaggin' wagon approaches Sean and Darren. It's raise hell, praise Dale, who's not too happy with them being next to the borehole. Dale goes to cut the rope as Sean straight up smacks Dale in the head with a rock. Hell yeah, brother. That's the caveman abilities that built this great society. Sean asks if he's okay. Well, you hit him in the head with a rock, so I'm gonna go ahead and say probably not. Taking the station wagon, they leave Dale's body, brutal, as Sean and Darren argue in the car after this. Which, I mean, y'all just relax. And don't kick the station wagon, that's a classic. So they are now on foot, falling through a crack in the ground, at least the tire did, but back of the mine, Dale wakes up, uh, saying, there is a breach, and then he's stabbed in the back and dragged off. Huh, you know what, I guess the rock didn't take him out, did it? 
It's almost a worse fate that he was really left with though. Like you could have grabbed him, I'm just saying. So in the night, Arian uses night vision after hearing something and realizes the creatures are there with them and boy are they ugly. They begin attacking the group as they make a run for it and they see a truck running towards it and we get this hilarious scene. So I know it's like a movie and it's filming, but as the woman fires a few shots, she hurriedly tells the driver to go, but he won't move until she sits down and you can tell there's this moment of connection where she's like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to sit because of safety protocols. He then slow slowly sort of takes off. I mean, you would think these things on your tail, you would be trying to GTFO, but Safety Steve over here needs you to buckle up first. Riding the truck through Super Happy Fun Time Adventure Mountains, they pull up with the rest of the town and are really what's left of them, which is mobilizing. They see maps and drawings as well as stations set up and they've been basically fighting these things all along, which I promise we're going to see these things in a moment. This movie took a while to actually bring out the threat where you could see it. Uh, they are then asked who they are and why they're there, proclaiming, I'm with the science team. <laughs> So they go on to say that they have purely academic reasons for being here, and Shutterman asks Ariane what her general sense of the area is after coming into contact with these things. Probably not good there, Papa Shuts. Uh, so they can't reach Dale at this point, we know why, but they don't. As Shutterman says, he's security and protection. Ariane asks what's happening, as he says it's purgatory, and we're being judged for our sins. I don't know, man. Uh, like, he says his sin was greed, but in reality, you were running a business and people depended on that income? It's not really that greedy. Plus, this is more of like a corporeal threat and not an ethereal one. Sometimes humans just have to fight other animals because that's the way the planet works. It's what made us the violent but intelligent species we are today. So they get a call saying the sinkhole was open, as it's becoming apparent these things are just the, the locust drones, really. Thus, the sinkhole, as mentioned earlier, will now be formally known as E-holes. They realize at this point, in fact, the locusts are here and they need to hide. They are stuck outside trying to stay quiet, but it's apparent they are screwed if they stay there. So you're about to just get a smorgasbord of self-sacrifice. It's like being like at an awkward Thanksgiving and the cook runs out of eggs for the deviled eggs, so they send someone to like get them and you volunteer just so you can get out of there. Except the cook is this event and leaving to get eggs is just shuffling off your mortal coil due to your own actions. Everyone is looking for any reason in this movie to just blow themselves up. It's rather odd. Also, I must clarify, my Thanksgivings aren't like that. My father-in-law, wife, and I proceed to drink copious amounts of wine and light stuff on fire. It's baller and it's always a blast. So Elroy is like, yeah, guys, it's been real, but I can't run quick enough. But I'm going to do the only thing I can obviously do, which isn't, you know, stay quiet and hide, but I'm going to blow myself up and maybe a few in the area that are nearby. He then kicks the tires and lights the fires and runs around the corner, burning the creatures and himself. I mean, you should have at least tried to make a run for it, right? I mean, then self-sacrifice if necessary. Or like, throw that thing in your hand at them. I'll never understand the lack of self-preservations in movies. Giving the group the chance to run, they then head inside and begin hiding, but the creatures have no eyes, but they can still hear pretty well. Being underground will do that. One is outside, and Shelby begins to tell them that she can't use the rifle as they're attracted to the noise. Yes, but you can put down any that gets close that's attracted to the noise. Uh, anyways, so her radio goes off as the creature's outside call for the others. She says they will paralyze you if they grab you, so don't get caught. They then play a nice game of keep away as they are forced to break open the doors as the creatures start to chase them. Heading into a crawl space, they end up in the opposite place that you would want to, underground in what is clearly a tunnel that was built down there, and probably not by humans. Okay, so now we finally see these creatures or have seen them hallelujah where we can talk about them the first thing to note about this species is fairly easy to spot but probably not because you don't really see them clearly they are bipedal species okay that one was pretty easy their overall body shape is that of a hominid so let's break down this creature real quick and i apologize but as we can see this movie literally hides these things from you but i have pulled source material and drawings that the town we're working on we're gonna have to use some of those starting at the feet these creatures have no toes like you or i which are abominations. However, they are plant-grade in structuring. In fact, it's a little alarming how much like Homo sapiens these creatures actually are. Their feet are much like the shape of ours as well, which would indicate this species were likely persistent hunters as the foot structure coupled with the Achilles heel would be presumed to be there and would actually store energy for each next step or run to be used in the next. Moving up to the legs, we see strikingly they are exactly like ours. The proportions of the calf muscle, shins, and even the knee joints are exactly like ours. The thighs have the same proportion as well to man's, which is uh, going to terminate in the upper leg at the pelvis. 
The abdominal muscle is actually not visible from what we can tell, and that is because the body is actually covered in an exoskeleton and it's not really skin at all. But something else to note, however, is much like a necromorph, there are partially formed arms that jut out of the abdominal exoskeleton. And this would give these creatures six legs in total, or six limbs, relating it to an ant, or so it would seem. As we move up to the thoracic region, the chest would indicate that these creatures potentially have lungs and much of the same organs as things on this planet. Unfortunately, none will be damaged to the point that we can learn about the being's internal anatomy, but a few assumptions can be made. First and foremost, due to the very apparent reliance on oxygen, as they're able to breathe Earth's atmosphere on the surface, it should be known that in caves, the atmosphere is different, especially in this cave. As made mentioned by Ariane earlier, the air has high levels of CO2, which made her concerned about needing to leave. If this species is down there and can exist in higher levels of CO2 in this environment, yet they're able to exist on the surface and breathe the trace amount, this indicates that they're not actually breathing just the small amount in our atmosphere, they are reliant on O2 for cellular respiration, but along with their specific cellular respiration, it must be more finely tuned than our own. And to this point, this means they must have a circulatory system. Because of the presence of the exoskeleton, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that like most insects, they also you know, have an exoskeleton, that this species would essentially have an open body concept. Basically, ants, arthropods, insects in general, they don't have a closed circulatory system, they have an open circulatory system, which pumps hemocyl around the body, which is oxygenated, and that's supposed to perfuse the organs. The first being that insects, again, they're smaller because this fluid encompassing their entire body and where it's moving through could not properly perfuse any of the tissues of an insect the size of a man. And to exist within an environment with even lower oxygen than normal, that would be the end of an insect. So the next thing that helps solidify that it does have a working closed circulatory system is the head is massive. And within it, a brain is most definitely consuming a lot of oxygen that it takes in. Without a dedicated circulatory system, the brain could never grow to that size. And this species is an active hunter beyond what most insects can pull off, which suggests a level of intelligence on par with maybe early man. Potentially a species that is either just coming out of its caveman days or landed here or possibly is stranded, but there is maybe a third option which we'll get into, but time will tell on that though. Moving down to the arms, we see this species has many of the same proportions as once again, it's basically a human body with a new head. Once we get down to the hands, however, we see something rather interesting. It has a poison claw. Well, it's called a poison claw, but this poison claw possesses a fast acting venom actually, because remember, poison is ingested, venom is injected. This venom disrupts voluntary musculature contractions, but does not paralyze the breathing muscles such as the diaphragm or intercostal muscles or the cardiac tissue, which is quite interesting. Disrupting the neuromuscular junctions associated with motor neurons cause a person to be rendered completely immobile. And along with that, we can assume this is done by disrupting the polarization of the neuronal tissue by blocking the intake of salts associated with firing of the neuron. It's really lucky it only affects the voluntary muscle because if it affected the rest of the body, you would flatline immediately. The venom itself is actually cleared relatively quickly from the body from our own natural waste removal systems. However, this does appear to take a few minutes and the initial depolarization event can render a person unconscious for a few minutes from likely a seizure-like event. One of the things to note, however, is you still have a giant hole in your body from being stabbed by this thing as the claw is about an inch and a half in diameter, which, I mean, bleeding out is still on the table if you don't get medical aid quickly. In fact, uh, at the end of the movie, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. So moving up to the head, we see the real moneymaker. The trapezius muscles holding the head are massive, probably because the dude has a massive head himself. A large crest sits center, and it may look as if exposed brain is everywhere, but that's actually just the exoskeleton appearance, apparently. There are no eyes, but the sides of the head sit exposed tissue that is sound sensitive, making the species exceptional at hearing any movement around them. We can assume the brain within is also relatively large, with the temporal lobes being sizable to help facilitate the deciphering of sound and its meaning. And this is due to the fact that they are underground. Sight is not going to be necessary, as sound would be, considering uh, they were just initially a troglobite species, meaning they lived underground the entire time and only recently are a new troglophilic species, meaning they live underground but come to the surface, and this supports that notion. But you want to know what's really down in the dark that can't see that's horrific? It's an anglerfish. On the front of the face exists the strangest structure of all. A circular mouth sits lined with teeth, and the creatures use to obviously eat anything that it can, or at least pure skin, but what it's eating is unknown and why it looks like that is a bit strange. 
Due to the size of the creature, or at least the scouts and how big they are, their mouth is somewhat reminiscent of a lamprey mouth, which would indicate it's attaching itself to something and sucking blood and fluids out of the body. Given the queen's size, which we will see here in a moment, it may be entirely possible that there is an unknown ecosystem down there on the interior of the planet that humanity has no idea about, allowing for these creatures to hunt other species and suck nutrition out of their bodies of animals that they take out below the surface. So back to the movie. Realizing they need to escape, which I'm pretty sure they realized immediately, Shelby creates a diversion. Again, the self-sacrifice. Bro, this is for real. They will suck you dry if they catch you. You know, actually, the rest of the group then hits a dead end as they find a tunnel leading away. As Jamie hilariously goes to throw a grenade, though he gets smacked really hard in the face, which allows for it to detonate right under him, completely taking him out as he has a neck wound now and likely many other shrapnel wounds. Ouchies. He's then dragged off, which leaves Ariane and Darren. Moving through, they are definitely lost as Darren says, oh, we lost him. Darren, you never say you lost him. That's really stupid. Ariane then suggests uh, they're being kept alive, maybe in the lower caves, and maybe she can save them. Darren finally comes clean, talking about how he was con contracted by a mining company and it was all for money bro who cares okay well arian then like she's like okay i'm taking you out here for money so i don't think she cares either dude as long as the check clears so then we get some backstory on arian at this point really not sure how this relates but uh, everyone is coming clean she basically got stuck with another guy that she was leading through the Himalayas. The two of them got stuck with him stranded and her holding the rope. Eventually, she was forced to basically drop him by her a cut in the line. God. Anyways, moving on. But because of this, uh, she won't leave him because she still feels guilty about that whole scenario. She says that she will come back for him and apparently Darren is injured. It's a dark movie. It's really hard to tell. Back on the surface, the town is now assembled, creating a lot of noise to draw on the creatures and then open fire on the Locust Horde. Eventually, Ariane then makes her way back there, hearing the gunfire in the distance. So these things are apparently everywhere though, and as she hides, one of them passes, but then she gets up to run and immediately gets stabbed by its paralyzation stick. Waking up underground again, things are going from bad to worse as she spots everyone else. Hearing chittering, which is the worst thing you can hear underground, she can't really move, and uh, then the creature stabs her again after yelling at her with a very strange looking face. Waking up once more, something falls into the cave with her, as this time she's super paralyzed. Darren asks if she can grab the grenade as he attempts to kick it to her, but she can't move too well. They then spot it. It's a giant worm, like creature that's been building the tunnels. Insert Anya, it's a giant worm here. Darren then calls it an alternative species, not really sure why it's an alternative species, but Sean says they breed and colonize much like ants, and then he's grabbed and brought over to what is presumably the queen. Sean prays like an alpha chad as he's unfortunately consumed by the thing, but Arian is able to reach the grenade before being dragged over. Looking at the size of the queen, this thing is massive, but it indicates that below the surface for a creature to be this large, there must be a wealth of nutrition in other areas that these creatures hunt that allows for them to flourish the way that they do. There would just not be enough nutrition on the surface to support a colony of this size or a queen of that size either. The only reason humans can exist in the numbers that we do is because of our farming techniques and transporting of food to cities and towns. This particular species would not be doing well if they didn't have some other way in which to obtain food from elsewhere in the planet. Because remember, as it appears, blasting for coal broke the barrier between the surface and the colony, introducing the two species. They have not always been eating humans until like very recently. So as she's lined up with the mouth, Darren then sets off his vitamin alarm, which activates the almonds of the creatures, as Arian then shoves a grenade up its face hole and blows it up. Luckily, the poison wore off literally at that exact moment, and they're able to run. As they run to the rope on the E-hole, they get their gear on as Arian then heads up first and Darren second. Climbing the rope to freedom, one of the creatures begin climbing as well as Arian drops the knife to Darren, and rather than do the smart thing and, like, kick the creature off or, you know, cut the rope below him or even at, like, right above his uh, carabiner, it, he's just like... Wouldn't it be hilarious if I cut the rope above me and then literally cuts the rope? Bro, it was one of these things. Keep kicking it until it falls. But instead, he needed to sacrifice himself to go pick up some eggs, which made me angry. Everybody's just wanting to meet their end. I, <laughs> big cringe, bro. Anyway, so Arian is just kind of like dangling there, right? And there's this guy up top who's like, I need to cut the line now, you know, because the creatures can reach her, right? Furthermore, how are these things even getting out in the first place? I'm assuming they're crawling on walls. How would cutting the rope do anything? Like, pull her up. But luckily, Papa Shoots and Ladders is there to push him out of the way like the idiot he is, because he is. However, he's not much better off in the mental faculty department because he reaches a handout despite the fact she's like 30 feet below, right? Grab the rope and pull her up. 
That is going to be way faster than waiting for her to drag herself up the rope. What is happening? Is the CO2 getting to everyone's brain? So climbing to the surface, they then use flamethrowers to burn the creatures giving chase. Like, where were these earlier? Shuts then asks who's all left, and it's just her. As he takes her back to the car, he says the creatures took his son, but they managed to contain these things, but it's an ongoing fight. Arian says they need to tell people, which he says, ah, they won't believe us, and they're not ready to hear this. No, bro. What you need to do is hope run deep these things with a chainsaw bayonet fixed. This needs to absolutely be a larger containment operation than what they're doing. Shut suggests, uh, you know, you should stay and help us fight these things. And she says, you can't possibly think you can win this. And then she gets out of the car as she goes to get her stuff, realizes there's really nothing to go back to anyhow, except that one client who likely already paid you, and then grabs her things as she heads back with Shuts to help fight these creatures. Bro, I am telling y'all, you need some LMGs, not these rinky-dink little rifles. But thus concludes The Devil Below. So the final thing I want to talk about before rounding this thing out is where do these creatures come from? While it's easy to assume they just crash landed here, I don't actually think that's reality. This species has clearly been in Earth's crust for a while, and the success that they have had in staying down there presumably forever shows that there is a vast ecosystem of undiscovered life that supports a food web with likely this species at the top given its intelligence. Which means there could potentially be something worse down there than an anglerfish. But it cannot be denied, their physiology is quite strange. In some ways, they are most definitely insect-like. The six legs, the exoskeleton, the lack of eyes. I mean, insects have eyes, but you, you get it, they're in a cave. But it also cannot be overlooked that their physiology also points to things like persistence hunting given their arms and legs. Bipedalism, while being exhibited in birds and humans, did not result in birds ruling the planet, but it did result in man becoming more intelligent and conquering this rock. This species seems to have had the same result for their own environment, so the question is, how do they come about? I see three options. All of them are going to be a little strange. The first one is, this species has always existed and continue to grow out of the insectoid era. It is not uncommon for two species to have similar traits despite never interbreeding. But what is hypothesized to have made us the way we are is we had to look over tall grass, but eventually this led to bipedalism and then persistence hunting. What this species would need for that for the underground area cannot be known, and this coupled with the fact that they crawl on the walls seems to make bipedalism redundant and unnecessary. And it did, however, allow for a larger brain, but they would still need the dedicated closed circulatory system, which again, it's not uncommon for species to develop similar traits. It's totally possible that this particular animal actually comes from the insects from way past when the oxygen levels were higher and there were giant forms of insects and then they developed a closed circulatory system which allowed for them to stay at the size that they are which then when the oxygen levels dipped those insects shrunk whereas they stayed relatively the same. The second option is that this species hasn't always existed here. That some time ago they crashed on earth and just have happened to have like the right set of adaptions to exist here like being oxygen dependent but able to survive in low two environments such as a burning cave. If this is the case, then it may be that it's like sort of like the descent almost, which it got copyright on my channel, which totally sucks. Don't even bother watching it. Humans uh, that were trapped in a cave system, at least this is the movie, became monsters over time and lost their higher mental faculties. If this is the case, it could help to explain their large heads and intelligence, as well as the reasoning they have and why they would even have a circulatory system available when those have not formed in any other insects that we know of on Earth. Obviously, if it's option two, this flies in the face of option one. But to this end, they would have evolved on another planet, crash landed on Earth, and descended into the caves for maybe safety, where they carved out a living. But then you have to ask yourself, why would they appear so human-like? Why would they be trapped in the caves? Why would they have not branched out on the surface? Is it possible a cave-in could have happened? But in advanced species, it just seems to me that if they can cross the stars, they would likely be able to do something about being trapped in a cave. I don't know. There may have been some escape. But the third option is really out there. But to me, I mean, it kind of stops a lot of the standard issues that we're having with the first two options. Could it be a genetic exchange? Don't be gross. We see the queen apparently eats a person, but is it really eating? This process may not be so much breaking a person down, but instead absorbing them and with that their genetic information is then disseminated to the descendants. How the queen would have developed this ability may be to make them more suited for the environment. Some of the species from the area are taken, absorbed by the queen, as those genes are applied to the next generation, which is a melding of insectoid species and other animals they have caught. Because remember, these creatures are never shown what they look like initially during the attack on the mining operation. Decades would pass as these creatures would begin basically showing up in earnest as they were released, and it's possible that animals are intentionally taken to the queen alive for some reason, and this is why. 
I mean, this is kind of a learned behavior, and this would suggest that to me, that their bodies are necessary beyond just eating. So if this is the case, then by combining the insectoid genetic coding with the human one would cause these creatures to be a hybridized species. They would stand like man and have all the proportions of man, but would still be very much so an insectoid species of where they come from and a colony at their core. And it may be that this is only specific or a specific cast of insect race. The scouts, as they are called, appear to be like man, but the queen clearly looks different from the scouts for a multitude of reasons and as such, different from man. This process could be as simple as the queen possessing the ability to utilize helicase to unzip DNA of the donor cells of a human and then utilize integrase to add it into the coating of the presumed eggs that it lays. And this may be how the scouts are fertilized for their specific function, basically taking on the traits of the creatures that they are hunting. This expendable class goes out and then finds food, looking in some ways and behaving similar to the species that they are hunting, maybe even actually reaping some of the intelligence aspect from human cells. They may even be like a haploid diploidy species as the eggs only possess half the chromosomes or are haploid. When a person is absorbed, the eggs become diploid, now having human traits. Believe it or not, this is the option that I think makes the most sense because it's the most fun. The extra traits these creatures have just for funsies makes no sense outside of that rationalization. They appear to me to be a combination of man and insect. But I want to hear what you guys think. Do you believe this species was always there? Do you think they're just a combination of man and insect? Or do you think they just crashed here? Let me know down in the comments because I crave interaction. If you enjoyed, then leave me a like would be very baller of you. And subscribe is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. Also, I'm bringing back merch, as you know, with someone who's making some pretty good shirts. So if you want to check that out, the link is in the description. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Road No Tales channel link. Where this week we talked about how a pair of green-skinned pre-adults appeared in a town in the 1100s. Uh, saying where they came from, nobody knows, but they describe the place being in a perpetual twilight, and all they would eat were beans. Very strange. Also, speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death Dancer, as well as our scientist, Chad the Enjoyer of Explanations of B-Grade Horror Movies, Florian, Lacune, Lucian Dragon, Octavia Serpentia, and the last final girl on the left. And the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help really does go a long way towards keeping this channel running and is greatly appreciated. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.